Glory God is what our hearts long for. Amen. Good stuff. Those last two songs sit uh, very well with our uh, message for today. And uh, <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, so it's good to see you guys. And um, I'd like to go to prayer again. And um, just thinking about Proverbs talks about uh, as our heart, or as a deer panteth for the water. Uh, that our hearts would desire and crave God's presence uh, today. So I, I would ask you for you to bow your head and close your eyes and, and pray a simple prayer. Just God help me to, to desire you again as that deer pants for water, as, a, as an animal desires water, as it's so thirsty. God, let my heart, help my heart to, to desire and crave you today. Father, we come before you and Lord, we pray that even if our hearts aren't in that place where we really do desire you today, God, that you would uh, stir as only you can and Lord, uh, draw us as only you can so that we would um, desire you, that we would want you, that we crave you, God, just as that uh, animal, that deer pants for the water, God, and let our hearts desire uh, for you. Lord, we love you and pray that you would stir in our hearts today, God. We love you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Well, as I said before, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to preach, and um, I'm going to actually be in the same passage today in John chapter number four, if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. And I'm, again, thankful that you guys didn't catch wind uh, that I'm preaching today so that you still showed up, and because if Brent came back or he called me after service and said, uh, how many do we have, or how things go, and I said, like, uh, we had like 10 people, and you know, it doesn't look good on me, so I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, hope it uh, speaks to your heart today. So, again, a few weeks ago, we uh, uh, talked about restoration through faithfulness. And we're going to do a little bit of a review uh, before we get into our message today. And we're going to be, in the, again, in the same passage. And uh, it's amazing to me. Uh, sometimes we can overlook uh, familiar passages. Because we're like, yeah, I've read the 100 times. I know it. And, and I've heard tons of messages on it. Uh, but I'm amazed at uh, what little things uh, stick out to you and, uh, and, and really just grab hold of your heart. And I pray that uh, you would kind of look at this uh, passage in the same way today, that don't just uh, brush it aside because you're familiar with the passage, but uh, I'm going to speak to you through it today. So again, we looked um, at this passage a few weeks ago, Restoration for Faithfulness is the title. And what we looked at is uh, we looked really at Jesus, and, and most of the time in this passage we really focus on a woman, which is actually what we're going to do today, but we focus on Jesus and, and the fact that he was uh, completely exhausted uh, when he goes through this, this uh, scenario. As he goes, uh, he's just traveled about 45 miles from Judea to Samaria uh, to, to meet this woman. He had set an appointment with this woman, even though she had no idea of that appointment. And uh, so he was tired, he was hungry, he was thirsty, he could have been sore. You know, I, I can imagine that he probably didn't eat uh, much at all, if, any, if not anything, uh, during his travels. Again, 45 miles walking uh, over these course of these days. So again, he's very exhausted. And uh, the, the, the disciples, they go to get uh, some food while he sits down on the well and waits uh, for this woman uh, to come. And yet, even through this uh, time as Jesus is exhausted, he's hungry, he's thirsty. As he was faithful in doing as God intended him and purposed him to do, uh, that he was restored through his faithfulness. And uh, we'll take a look at that in here in just a moment. So we're going to read uh, uh, starting in verse number seven, and we'll skip around uh, just a few verses here. So if you want to learn, uh, look in uh, John four, verse number seven. We'll start right there. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said, uh, saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this, uh, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. 
but the, uh, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me, the, uh, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Skip over to verse number 25. The woman saith uh, unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, cometh, the Messiah comes, uh, which is called Christ. When he uh, is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, he really drops a bomb on her right here, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came unto him. Then down in verse number 39, the last one. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So Jesus, again, he is restored through this faithfulness. He was exhausted, he was tired, but yet through him being faithful, uh, he was restored through this, uh, this, uh, this meeting, this encounter with this woman. Um, it's interesting as the disciples come back, they, they, they bring him food back, right? And uh, he says, I, I'm good, boys. I don't, I don't need anything to eat. And they're just baffled by this or confused. And uh, I'll pose the question to you and let you guys have a little uh, time to talk back to me. But why, why was he not interested in this food anymore? What, what had happened to where he said, I didn't need it anymore? Even though he had been journeying so long, he was exhausted, he was hungry and thirsty. And yet, for some reason now, he, he doesn't need something to drink. So what, what would you say? What, what was the reasoning for that? Don't be too bashful. It's like our, question, our class on Sunday mornings are just like... He's excited because the woman found salvation. Absolutely. He's excited uh, because she got saved. Amen. Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. What he was doing was way more important. What was so good, you say? He said that God gave him the living water and he gave it. Absolutely. Yeah, God poured into him and he poured out. Uh, look at verse number 32 through 34. It says, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him ought to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. I was fulfilled. Jesus says, I was fulfilled through being faithful. Even though I was exhausted, even though I was tired, I was I had the sense of fulfillment in my life because I was faithful and did fulfill the purpose that God had given to me. Um, which really brings us into uh, our message today. And, and the title I've given uh, for today is that we're restored um, through uh, our purpose. Restored through our purpose. So again, we're going to take a look at the woman today. Restored through purpose. Um, we're going to take a look at her. And so first of all, I want to just look at three kind of descriptive words for this woman. Uh, and... and well, just to throw it out there. Uh, these three words, promiscuous Samaritan woman. All right, promiscuous. That was the best and, and softest word I could come up with for that, okay? Uh, she is uh, definitely, uh, un, in, in the society, in her city, she is um, known for, for some things, and, and they're not very good things. We'll just put it at that, okay? Uh, and some scriptures that we didn't read uh, in, in John there. Uh, she has been married five times. Uh, she's living with a guy. And, uh, and, and I'm sure that that's not all the, the story. There's, that just kind of gives a, a clue as to what's been going on. And that, and in no means uh, do I want to uh, hurt anyone that's been through any situations through divorce and those types of things. But, but this woman has, has uh, really taken it to another level. And she has definitely been doing some, uh, some promiscuous things. Again, uh, you could uh, change the word there and, and kind of get a better understanding of, of what she is uh, doing at this time. So um, she has uh, been going around and she's not, uh, again, has a bad rap, a bad reputation uh, in the city. Uh, you could kind of give her the song and, and uh, really dedicate it to, to her as uh, looking for love in all the wrong places, right? Uh, this is kind of where she's at in her life. And if you look about it even, even deeper and you think about the Old Testament, uh, adulterous, uh, when caught in adultery, remember the woman that was brought to Jesus, in the Old Testament, the law was that if they were caught in adultery, that they were to be stoned to death. And so she was, this was the circumstances that she was in, and she was, uh, by the Old Testament law, she could have, uh, this could have happened to her, right? 
And so, again, so just describing of, of understanding of where she is in her life. The next aspect, another next word is that she's a Samaritan. Now, it may not uh, really strike us real, uh, real quickly there. What's, what's so important about that? Who are these Samaritans? Well, the Samaritans uh, started uh, when Assyria went in and conquered uh, the ten tribes of Israel. The ten and the two, they divided back in you know, the Old Testament, Lord, you know, and all that. But, so Assyria goes in and they conquer the ten tribes. And uh, so these guys were bad. They were destroying. They were, they were killing people rampantly. And so uh, any of the Israelites that, that remained there and weren't destroyed, as time went on and that, uh, the, those people began to marry, the Israelite people there began to marry the Assyrians, and they became known as the Samaritan race, okay? Again, it may not seem like that big of a deal, but you've got to realize that, first of all, these, these people came in and destroyed, obliterated their nation. I mean, just destroyed cities, killed their families, and all these things. And now, some of these people go and they marry those same people that, that have killed perhaps their brother or their, their father or their, their mom. And, and so there is some controversy there. And so now the, 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 these people, these Samaritan people that came through that, um, there's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of hatred from the Israelite people towards the Samaritans. It'd be as if ISIS came and, and destroyed America and some of us remained and, and maybe your daughter married an ISIS soldier or something that killed the rest of your family. That would be kind of equivalent to, to what's taking place here. So the Israelite people really hated the Samaritans, okay? So we're just kind of putting the picture down here of, of what the, the, the people think about this woman, where she is in her life and, and those things. So um, the last thing is, just the fact that she is a woman, uh, and by no means <laughs> don't want to offend anybody with this either, but in this context, in this day and age, uh, this was not, uh, a woman was not on the same level as a man. They were way lower class. Women and children were a uh, subclass under men, um, and so they were kind of, you don't speak unless spoken to kind of mentality here, and so, uh, so she's got a lot going against her uh, with the things that she has uh, done and, 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 and uh, who she is as this woman, okay? So just kind of laying some foundation of, of who this woman was. So we see as, as Jesus talks to her and they have a lot of conversation that goes on here and then Jesus drops that bomb and says, uh, she goes, I know the Messiah is going to come and Jesus says, I'm, I'm him, right? And so things completely change for her in that moment. This is her salvation moment. This is when she comes and, and accepts Christ as her, as her Lord and her Savior, okay? So things really take a different path for her at this time. And so the first thing I want us to realize is that, that our first step in restoration is this salvation. That it's, it's only through Christ that we can be restored, uh, and if you're here and that you've never accepted Christ, Christ has not been your Lord, your Savior, that that's our first step. And we can never have true restoration in our life until we come to Christ uh, for that restoration. But then after that, now, as we've been restored in our in salvation sense, now we have been given a, a whole new purpose, a whole new uh, intention in life. And so that's what I want us to focus on over the next few minutes is how this woman's life is completely changed. Her, her ambitions, her intentions, her purpose is uh, completely transformed as she encounters Jesus. Okay, so let's look at verse number 28. Verse number 28. We're just going to break this down just to like a few words at a time. The very first thing that we see that she does, it says, the woman then left her water pot. And she left her water pot. Her plans completely and suddenly shifted her intentions her purpose she left her water pot she was not likely a, a wealthy woman she probably didn't have an abundance of kitchen supplies at her home uh, you can realize that there's not stores that they go and buy this stuff you know readily available to them and so uh, this was a, a very significant thing for her to have a, a water pot and to, to keep that and to make sure that it doesn't break what does she do she leaves her water pot. I mean, this is a very significant piece of, of uh, kitchen supplies that she had. Uh, she needed this, obviously, to go to the well to receive the water and then to be able to carry it back to her house. I mean, this is a life-giving uh, piece of equipment that she needed uh, very much so. 
And what does she do? She leaves it. Why does she leave it? Because um, there's some change that's happening here. Her, her purposes, her intentions, her life is being changed. And so what used to matter and, and be the only source of, of real hope and fulfillment in her life and, and what she was ambitious about all of a sudden begins to change. And now she leaves the, the source of strength, the, the security of, of this water pot. She leaves it behind and now she leaves it and just goes away. She leaves it at the well. It's not like she like carried it to her house, left it there, and then went and did what she was going to do. No, she leaves the water pot. It's very significant uh, because of just the, 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 the purpose change, the whole life change that takes place in this instance of when she comes to, uh, to salvation. She encounters Jesus for the very first time. As I think about this transformation and, and salvation, um, and, and we see how her purposes are changed. She's no longer just thinking about how can I get the next thing that is going to fill my belly or fill me uh, with a sense of joy for a, a limited time. She's no longer so ambitious about those things. But as I, as I wonder about that and how quickly she changes and, and goes and leaves these, these security blankets, if we will, um, I begin to think about myself. I begin to think about us and say, okay, if, if we've been saved, if, if we've really encountered Christ, then um, what kind of change has there been? Uh, what kind of intention change? What kind of purpose? What kind of ambitions have, have transformed in our lives? Or, or, or are they very much the same as they were before we came to Christ? And the only thing that's really changed is how we go to church on Sunday morning. Like, that, that's, that's not the extent of, of what the transformation that Christ wants in our lives. It's not just coming to church on Sunday morning. It's, it's far deeper, far more than that. A few examples of, of kind of this analogy of, of what our life was and what it should be and what kind of changes it should have in it now. Um, one is that the Bible says that we're a new creature or a new creation in Christ. A completely new formation, has taken, a completely new creature has, have we been made in Christ. And so if something is completely made new, it's, it's completely transformed it shouldn't look identical to the old one, should it? It should be different. It's a new creation, a new creature. The Bible also says Jesus said that he came to give life and an abundant life, right? An abundant life. Look, think about your old life and think about your new life that you've been born again in Christ. Is your old life and your new life, are they about as abundant as they were before? Again, maybe the only difference that we have is that, oh, I go to church on Sunday morning. I, we're, we're called to have an abundant life. God, Jesus said, I, I came not just to give you life, but an abundant life, a flowing life, a, a overflowing life. And the greatest, perhaps, example of this change would be that he says that you were a dead man, and now you're a living man. Like, you can't get much bigger of a change than that, right? Death to life. Uh, that's, there's, everything has changed in that moment. And so if, if we are, are saved, if, we're, if we've been born again, then, then there should be some change. There should be some transformation. That our ambitions should be different. That our purpose for living should be different. It's this woman, she leaves her water pot. She says, no longer is my only uh, focus in this life to be about my physical needs. My, my, our focus should not just be going to work and paying our bills and, and just being responsible for those things. Like, this is a completely different look. Our attitudes, our focus, uh, our giving, everything should be completely changed uh, again from death to life, a new creation. She left her water pot. Her purpose for life has transformed as should ours. So she leaves her water pot. The next thing that she does in, in verse number 28 again, it says the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men. So to the city and speaks to the men. Let's, let's look at these two, two aspects here real quick. Why was she at the, the well at noontime? Why was she at the well at midday? Because of the reputation, right? Because she didn't want to be around people. Um, now, 
that seems to have taken the back seat, right? Now, where does she go? She's not at the, the well in the middle of the day by herself. Now, where does she go? To the city in the middle of the day when everyone's walking around, when the market, marketplace is booming, when everyone is there. No longer is she worried about being seen and what, what uh, snickers and, and, and things that are said and, and, and what things could even perhaps be done to her. Again, an adulterous woman could have been stoned to death. No longer is she concerned about what are people going to think, what are people going to say, even more importantly, what are people going to do to me? All of a sudden, her, her purposes have changed, her ambitions have changed, her, her focus has changed. It's no longer on getting water. Now her, her focus is on going to the city, to the men of the city, and telling them about some guy that she just met. She goes to the city. She, again, is no longer worried about being around people, all those things seem to have, uh, have changed and transformed in her. Again, she goes to the men. Uh, again, we said that she was a woman. Remember that was like in that time frame, she was lower. She was underneath the men. Well, that was just men in general. It says she goes to the men, like the head honchos of the city, like the politicians, the main men of the city. She doesn't just go and like, you know, whispering to a couple guys, you know, here and there. She goes to the main men of the city and she begins to declare what has happened to her. Why does she go to the men? Because her, her purposes have changed. Her passions have changed. Her ambitions have changed. And she's no longer worried about uh, the former things. Now, this is the point where uh, I've heard different people say, man, well, that's, that seems kind of like irresponsible, like dumb, like Seriously, leave your water pot? Like, like, doesn't God want us to take care of ourselves? Like, doesn't he want us to provide for our families and those things? Well, yeah, obviously. But, but how many times do we use that as an excuse and, and elevate those responsibilities above the purposes of God? And we excuse, we say, well, I've got I've to go to work, I've got to provide, I've got to do all these things. So God's purposes for my life just take a backseat and, and really uh, we just elevate this so much that it becomes an idol and we don't even think about the purposes of God for our life. How many times do we elevate those things far beyond what God intended them to be? She was not irresponsible in any way uh, in doing these things. Let's look at verse number 29 now. So she leaves her water pot. She goes to the city when all the people are around. She goes to the men of the city. And now let's look at what she says in verse 29. First four words. Come see a man. Come see a man. She's restored through her purpose. This is her purpose to go to the city, to go to the men and declare this one statement. Come see a man. That's your purpose as a believer. That's my purpose as a believer is to tell people, listen, you need to come and encounter this man that I just met. You need to come and see this man that I met. You need to come and, and experience what he has for you. All the things that you've been chasing after, all the empty wells that you've been going to, you need to come and see this man that I just met. You need to come talk to him. You need to come experience this man, you and I have that same purpose to declare to all people, come see a man. Come see a man. Notice what else she says in verse number 29. It's just, it's just baffling me. I can't believe that she would go this far in, in, in saying these things. It's just amazing. Verse number 29, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. What was she just doing moments ago? Maybe 30 minutes before this, she was sneaking to a well in the middle of the day, avoiding people. She might have been hiding behind trees and just scoping things out, making sure nobody's there. Now, she leaves her water pot. She goes to the city. Uh, she talks to the men. She says to them, come see a man boldly. I mean, she's not worried about these guys anymore. And then she says, which told me all things that ever I did. Wasn't she just trying to keep all that stuff under wraps just a few moments ago? Wasn't she trying to say, um, um, but even she says to Jesus, uh, we called a husband, and she says, I don't have a husband. 
Wasn't she just trying to conceal all of her skeletons in the closet, like hide all that stuff? Oh, no, I don't, I don't have a husband. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? What does she do now? Come see a man who told me every dirty secret that I ever kept. Everything that I've kept in darkness, everything that I've ever hidden, he just exposed it all. That's not like evangelism 101, is it? I mean, that's not like what you go and do and, and say, hey, come see a guy that, go, that told me all of my dirty secrets, and here they are. I'll tell them to you, too. You know what's, what's cool about this is that when our hard, dark secrets are exposed, as, as much as we don't want them to be exposed, and we're so fearful of that, that when they're brought to light, it brings so much liberty. It brings so much freedom. Because no longer do we have to act like we got it all together. No longer do we have to pretend. Jesus exposes all those things. And now, as her whole personality, her whole purpose, her whole intention for life has changed now, not concealing it and trying to hide it under the rug anymore, now she's like, you told me everything I know. Her purposes have changed so entirely that now that doesn't seem to be a problem for her anymore. She doesn't seem to be afraid of those things anymore. She says, come see a guy that he told me everything. He told me all of my dirty secrets. He, he exposed them all. Even the things that I didn't even know that I had hidden so deep in my heart, he exposed them all. The last thing that she says to him in verse number 29, just simply says, is not this the Christ? Isn't this the one that we've been waiting for? Come see this man. Told me all things that ever I did. Isn't this the one? Her purposes had changed because she had been restored. Restored through having purpose that oftentimes we, when we have no purpose, we're kind of shooting blind in the dark. We, just, we don't know where to go. And, and when we, we think our purpose in life is uh, to make more money or to have security and, and all these other things, when we think that that is our the, the target that we're aiming at, uh, and, and we aim at it, we shoot at it, and it doesn't fulfill, it doesn't satisfy as you think it's going to. And so you try another target when you don't really know what your purpose is, then, then there's just this emptiness. There's just this, I don't know where to go. But when we find our purpose in life, when we, when we find that our purpose is not our own, it's not about finding security, it's not a better job, it's not a nicer house or car, it's not those things that are just going to leave us empty when we find that our purpose is completely consumed and wrapped up in, in, in glorifying God through the, the redemption and, and the declaring of God's goodness to them and Christ's salvation to them. When we find that this is our purpose, we find restoration in this and we find that no longer those things matter anymore and I, and I find fulfillment and satisfaction in, in, in doing what Christ has called me to do. Again, with no uh, real purpose in life, we, uh, we, just, we just drive ourselves insane. Uh, we just go crazy. But when we find that purpose and that it's wrapped up in Jesus, things completely, uh, completely change. Jesus restores every broken heart, every screwed up life. Jesus restores and brings healing. That is our purpose. That is what we are to declare. That is what we're to, to declare. That's our purpose. Um, uh, there's a song, it's kind of an older song actually now. We're going to actually play it here in, in just a few moments. But uh, Mark Hall, uh, Casting Crowns, he, uh, uh, the song Come to the Well, probably most are familiar with it. And uh, it's really wrapped up in this, uh, this passage here. And I had forgotten all about this, the song and uh, a, a short book that Mark Hall had uh, written uh, just called the well, and I would really encourage you to pick it up. It's just like a 50 or 75 page book. It's a real easy, quick read, but a very powerful read. Um, in this book, uh, Mark Hall uh, makes this statement about this woman, and uh, I think it really sums up what we do when we're chasing after our purpose in, in so many other areas, and, uh, and we just are left empty and dry. The statement he made is this, the woman thought she was standing next to a well talking to a man, but in fact, she was standing next to a hole in the ground talking 
to the well. She thought she was standing next to a well talking to some man, but she soon found out that she was just standing next to this empty hole in the ground, and she was talking to the well. You know, we uh, lower our water pots down into a lot of empty wells. We uh, look for fulfillment and satisfaction in a whole lot of places in our lives, and it only comes up empty. It only comes up empty every single time. I mean, you realize that um, the source of purpose, the source of meaning, the source of satisfaction is not in anything that this world has to offer us. It's only in the well, the well being Jesus. What did she say? say? She said, come see a man. Come see a man. Come to this man that, that told me everything I ever did is not this, the Christ. This is the one that we need. This is the one that we, our hearts are longing for, even though we don't know our hearts are longing for it. That's why we chase after all these other things, because our heart has a longing, has, has a, a void, and we're, we're looking for something to, to satisfy, to fulfill it. And so we run from one thing to another. As soon as one lets us down, we run to another one. We lower our water pot into another empty well, only to bring up sand. We're chasing after all the empty wells. Jeremiah, I believe it talks about these broken cisterns, these, these uh, basins that were dug into the ground and they were there to, to hold water and that they're, they're filled with cracks. And so every time you pour something into it, it just runs out those cracks and so you're left empty once again. And we're working so hard and we're doing all these things. We're chasing and running and running and running only to be more exhausted and more unsatisfied than we were with the last one. We don't have to chase after a bunch of empty wells anymore. We don't have to go and stand next to this hole in the ground thinking that it's going to bring me what I need and fill me the way that I need to be filled. Realize that Jesus is the only one that can do it. Come, I plead with you, come see a man. Come encounter a man. Maybe you're lost. Maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you, you haven't been in church many times and you've, you know about Jesus, but, but maybe you've never experienced him, encountered him as this woman had, had been before this encounter. Jesus sets appointments with us and we don't even know about him, but he is passionately pursuing you and I and he wants to fill you with what he has. If you've never encountered Christ like that today, know that he's pursuing you. Know that he desires you beyond your imagination and come and encounter Christ, come see you, man. That's what my plea for you, and that's what each and every one of our uh, pleas should be to every person that we come across, is to come see a man that will fill and satisfy as only he can and nothing else. Come see a man. Again, if you're lost, if you, you don't know Christ, I, I, I plead with you to, um, to encounter Jesus. Come see a man. If you're a Christian, you're a believer, and maybe you're dry, maybe you've been, uh, you know Jesus, but you've been, been putting, you've been carrying your water pot, and you've been lowering it down into a whole bunch of holes, and, and you've been trying to find satisfaction, you've been trying to find fulfillment and purpose in your life, know that you can be restored through the purposes that God has given to us, and it's not to chase after money, it's not to chase after things, it's not to chase after anything else that in spite of what circumstance that we're going through, we can find fulfillment and satisfaction in Jesus and Him alone. Don't keep lowering those water pots down in those empty holes. Come to see this man. Come to the only well that really satisfies.
Is my savior. Is my savior. 